The Theory of Need and Marx by Agnes Heller. This is chapter three, the concept of social need. In Marx's view, the concept of social need is not a category which is in itself alienated, but one which has a rational meaning in every society, even after the positive overcoming of alienation. However, it is one of his least precise concepts, and he uses it in several different ways. It is used to describe various social facts, including, often, the capitalist alienation of needs. But if we study the main tendency of Marx's thought, we shall find that this relevant, that this interpretation is only one among many, <clears throat> and that it is only relevant for capitalist society. It is therefore completely foreign to his overall conception to identify the category of the general interest with And lost my place already with that of social need. This point must be strongly emphasized because in Marxist writing the two categories are commonly treated as synonymous. I am referring not only to the fetishistic interpretation of the concept of social need but also to the assumption of positive value which lies behind this fetishized interpretation. It is formulated in such a way that social need becomes a need of society, not the whole or the average of the personal needs of individuals, nor the evolving tendency of such needs, nor socialized personal need, but a general system of need which, so to speak, is suspended above individual people and is at a higher level than the personal needs of the individuals who constitute society. This conception has led to various conclusions and consequences, both in theory and in practice. The two most important of these should be mentioned. A. Since the so-called social need is more general at a higher level than personal need, then in cases of conflict, the individual should subordinate to the social need. His own demands for satisfaction of his personal needs in practice, this kind of social need turns out to be the need of the privileged or dominant layers of the working class or of society disguised by their halo of general validity. Uh, B. Social needs are the real, genuine needs of individual people. Those people who have de facto needs which cannot be represented as social need simply have not yet recognized their genuine needs. From this conception, there follows a distinction between recognized and unrecognized needs. But who is to decide which of people's needs are genuine? Once again, it can only be the representatives of the so-called social need. In other words, the actual needs of the privileged and of the leaders of the movement are incarnations of universality and socialization. And it is they who decide which of the needs of the class, that is, of the overwhelming majority, of the population are correct and which incorrect. Thus, the actual existing needs of the majority are classified as false. The representatives of the social needs then take it upon themselves to decide the needs of the majority and to pursue the alleged unrecognized needs instead of people's real and actual needs. I shall leave aside the practical consequences of this fetishization of the concept of social needs and simply add that the fetishized concept of need has been fabricated in a similar way to that of interest. We have already seen, on the basis of Marx's own analysis, that the subordination of self to the general interest is in fact correlated with the pursuit of personal interest. Both the bourgeois and the citizen are necessary to the functioning of bourgeois society. Moreover, we can sensibly distinguish between recognized and unrecognized interests. Interest is in fact constituted by opposition of interests. The identity of interests is really the identity of their opposition. Interest is the reduction and at the same time the homogenization of needs. In the same way that we give to self, whether self signifies a person, an association or a class, the value of our own reciprocal determination against others. It is therefore realistic to assert that this that the person, the nation, the class, etc., who 
fails to assert himself over others is, falling, is failing to act in accordance with his own interests. Furthermore, if a person, an association, a class, does not clearly see the optimal means of asserting his claims, then he has not recognized his own interests. If the optimal means of asserting claims in the intercourse of the various objectifications or objectivations are different or directly opposed, one may then reasonably speak, speak of conflicts of interest. Let us return to Marx's position, as we have seen. As we have seen, he speaks on various occasions of real and imaginary needs, but never and nowhere does he speak of unconscious or unrecognized needs. Both the real and the imaginary are consci conscious. Moreover, it is precisely in order to circumvent the category of unrecognized needs that Marx requires the concept of radical needs. He ascribes the latter to the working class more than once, though he does not consider them as being present de facto in the class. Where there are unrecognized needs, there are also educators, whose job it is to make people conscious of their needs. But it is well known that Marx rejected this conception of unrecognized needs as early as the theses on Feuerbach, where he treats it as what it really is, a category from the Enlightenment. Marx recognizes no needs other than those of individual people. One may calculate or budget for an average of individual needs, as we have seen in the case of necessary needs, but these are still the needs of individual people. Only in his description of fetishism does Marx use the category of need with its fetishistic meaning in order to contrast it with needs which are not fetishistic and which are therefore those of individuals. Let us take, for example, the passages from Capital quoted on page 24, where he defines capitalist alienation by the fact that it is not the workers' needs of development that are decisive, but the need to valorize capital. This latter expression is consciously used here in a fetishistic sense. For although the need to valorize capital is all, always the need of an individual capitalist, the capitalist too is an alienated power. A representative of capital. In capitalist society, relationships between human beings, like needs, appear as reified relationships, but in fact they are still relationships between human beings. As I have already said, Marx uses the concept of social needs in various senses. The most important meaning, and the most frequently used, is that of socially produced need. The relevant passages have already been quoted in the first chapter, and I will not repeat them here. Socially produced needs are the needs of individual human beings. In some places, this classification includes as a whole needs that are not natural needs, and in other places, it includes all needs indiscriminately. In this latter interpretation, socially produced need is synonymous with human need, where human is not a value category. In another sense that appears less often, but nevertheless with a certain frequency, social need is a positive value category. It is the need of man for communism, the need of the so-called socialized man. In the third volume of Capital, capitalist society is once again contrasted with the society of associated producers, precisely from the standpoint of needs. The expansion or, con or contraction of production are determined by profit, and the proportion of this profit to the employed capital, thus by a definite rate of profit rather than the relation of production to social needs, i.e. to the needs of socially developed human beings. Here, therefore, social need means the needs of socially developed humanity. It is unnecessary to emphasize that here too social need means the need of the indiv individual human being. Social need is given a third meaning when it is used to describe average needs for material goods in a society or a class. When Marx uses the concept in this sense, he often puts the expression social need in inverted commas, and he does so deliberately. Social need in inverted commas is the expression of needs in the form of effective demand. Without the inverted commas, it means those needs relating to material goods which do not find expression in effective demand. 
The distinction is only relevant for Marx in relation to the working class, since he admits that for the ruling classes, material need and effective demand at least overlap. And generally speaking, effective demand is greater than the real need, the necessary need, of the ruling classes. For the working class, the discrepancy lies between social need, which appears in the form of effective demand, and so-called true social need, the latter not only quantitatively outstripping the former, but also containing qualitatively concrete needs of a different kind. In Capital, Marx says, Social need, i.e. the factor which regulates the principle of demand, is essentially subject to the mutual relationship of the different classes and their respective economic position. A few pages later, arguing the matter more deeply, he says, It would seem then that there is on the side of demand a certain magnitude of definite social needs which require for their satisfaction a definite quantity of a commodity on the market. But the quantitative determination of this need is very elastic and changing. Its fixedness is only apparent. If the means of subsistence were cheaper or money wages higher, the laborers would buy more of them and a greater social need would arise for them. The limits within which the need for commodities represented on the market, i.e. demand, is quantitatively different from real social need naturally vary considerably from one commodity to another. Social need here refers to demand and is therefore mere appearance, which does not express the real social needs of the working class, and so disguises them as their opposite. But what are these real social needs? For Marx, the content of this category corresponds essentially to the empirical and sociological content of necessary needs. It needs to be emphasized, however, that this is an average, more precisely, it is the average of individual needs, historically developed, handed down by custom and containing moral aspects. We are dealing here with an objective category, a given human being, a belonging to a given class at a given period of time, is born into a system and hierarchy of needs which, although it is determined by the objects of his needs and by the customs and morality of preceding generations, is nevertheless constantly changing. He will internalize this, even though in an individual manner, to a greater or lesser extent in different societies. This is in no way, however, an autonomous structure suspended above the members of a class or of a society. The need of the individual is what he knows and feels to be his need. He has no other needs. Thus, in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, Marx laments the absence of needs amongst the workers. He is not saying that workers are conscious of the needs which appear in the form of effective demand, but unconscious of their true needs that do not appear in this form. In the latter case, social needs would not be flexible. What he is saying is rather that true social needs represent actual thoroughly conscious needs, whilst the social needs that are presented on the market indicate the possibilities of satisfying true social needs in a given society. It is not a question of a contrast between conscious and unconscious, but as Marx says in The Poverty of Philosophy, of a contrast between being and not being, between realizing and not realizing, between what is satisfiable and what is not satisfiable. Let us add that Marx applies this interpretation of social needs only to material needs and to those non-material needs that are purchasable by means of exchange value. As regards other non-material needs, the category of social need in the above sense is altogether irrelevant. It is, of course, true that there is an objective character not only to material needs, that is, to social needs as interpreted above, but also to needs generically, to the need for artistic activity, or the need for fellowship or love. The system of needs already realized, i.e. the hierarchy of needs, guides the needs of man born in a specific society, because needs can only develop in interaction with objects and realizations as objects, and because these objects demarcate the limits of the needs. But Marx never considers the need for artistic activity or love as social needs in the sense specified here. The satisfaction of such needs through exchange value is for him, as we have already seen, 
the most characteristic form of the phenomenon of alienation, the quantification of the unquantifiable. Let us look finally at the fourth meaning of social needs, the social or sometimes communal satisfaction of needs. This is a non-economic interpretation serving to define or express the fact that men have needs which are not only socially produced, but which also are satisfiable only by the creation of corresponding social institutions. In modern society, for example, the satisfaction of the need to learn is possible only by means of adequate institutions for public instruction. The same thing applies to the need for health care and to innumerable kinds of cultural needs, even to the need for community. In this last case, the creation of appropriate institutions is not absolutely necessary. However, it is a need which, by its very nature, is satisfiable only in togetherness with others. Although the category is not economic, we can however find an economic aspect in it. In the critique of the Gotha program, Marx writes that it is necessary to deduct from the gross income of labor that which is destined for the communal satisfaction of needs such as schools, health services, etc. It is interesting to observe how Marx attributes to purely material social needs a character of relative quantitative stability. Their quantity should increase almost exclusively in parallel with growth of the population. The part of these social values that serves the communal satisfaction of needs will increase rapidly in the future. An ever greater percentage, percentage of the gross income of labor will be necessary for the satisfaction of such needs. From the outset, this part is considerably increased in comparison with present day society, and it increases in proportion as the new society develops. Needless to say, Marx most certainly does not consider this shift as the true conscious needs of men, becoming related to personal consumption, with unrecognized needs becoming represented by the communal satisfaction of needs. For the future, Marx envisages men for whom, ab ovo, these needs, which are only satisfiable socially, appear as conscious and personal, personal needs the satisfaction of which will be so important that they themselves will set the limit on other needs. We know that, according to Marx and the Society of Associated Producers, it is only other needs which set limits on human needs. When the domination of things over human beings ceases, when relations between human beings no longer appear as relations between things, then every need governs the need for the development of the individual the need for the self-realization of the human personality.